We'll get to the text in just a minute. I want to give a quick uh, prologue or introduction to the sermon this evening. Now, this is going to be running in the series that I've uh, been you know, going through Sunday evenings. It's kind of an unofficial series, as I often will do, just kind of a streamline of thought on the subject of tribulations, trials, persecutions. This has been going on for two and a half, probably three months. And we went over all different aspects of discouragement. Why problems arise, how to deal with problems, persecution coming from the devil, persecution coming from the world, but just how to react and to respond to hard times, how to look at it. You know, last, uh, the very last one that we had was uh, uh, two uh, Sunday evenings ago. We went over the subject with David. And last week, of course, we talked about the heart of David, which tied in with that. But two weeks ago, we talked about David. And I talked about seeing the big picture. And how oftentimes we we don't realize that you know all of the blessings that the men of God of the Old Testament received were were balanced out or were countered with a lot of negative. David is a man that we think of of, of being blessed mightily, but we also forget that David was a man that had more problems and trials and tribulations than probably any other person in the entire Bible. He's a man after God's own heart. He's a very godly man. He's a better man than you know probably any man that was in the entire Old Testament. But he was a man that had more trouble, trials, tribulations, persecutions, and problems than any other person in the Bible. Now, oftentimes, people react in different ways to this. Michaela, Michaela, give me some water, please. People will respond and react, and they'll view their life and their problems in different types of ways. Now, sometimes you, know, you have those out there that preach you know, the prosperity gospel, that if something bad is happening in your life, well, then you must be doing something wrong. You have to be doing something wrong. And they have these two you know, sides here that you have to be on, which that's false. That's not true. We know that the Bible teaches that all that will live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. So everyone that lives godly will go through persecution. There is no one that is exempt to this. There is no one that is excluded from this. Anyone who lives a godly life is going to suffer persecution. Without a doubt, it's going to happen. So we can see that there are lies that are in this prosperity gospel, that everything will be perfect in your life. You'll never have any problems or trials, right? But also, sometimes it can be that we can be going through trials and tribulations, not because we're living godly, sometimes because we're living ungodly. Sometimes it, we need to have the attitude, and I spoke about this a couple of weeks ago as well, Lord, is it I? Is there something that I am doing? These are all different things that may be going on in our life. It may be caused by the devil. It may be caused by persecution from the world because we're living a godly life. There are many different reasons that problems and trials and tribulations can come into our life. These are just some of them. And I'm going to be talking about another reason why these types of things can come into our life. The title of the sermon and the subject I'm going to be preaching on this evening is God May Want You to Lose. God May Want You to Lose. Now, I want to begin by saying this. God may want you to lose, yes. God may want you to lose a battle. But God does not want you to lose the war. God will want you sometimes to lose battles in your life. God will want you know, troubles and trials and tribulations to come in your life sometimes, to go through hard times. And it's true, and I'm going to show you this from Scripture, that this is true. God may want you to lose. Now, of course... Ultimately, and I'll go ahead and, and, and give you the conclusion now of, of all problems and trials and tribulations that happen to the Christian. Ultimately, all things work together for good to them that love God, to them who are on the call according to his purpose. So if God allows something to happen to us, if we look at the big picture, for whatever reason, if he allows it, if it's persecution, he allows it. If it's the devil that's hurting us, and he allows it. If it's because of our sin, and he allows it, that's his punishment, Right? He wants there to be good that comes out of it at the end. He wants there to be a positive. Yes, there is a present-day negative. There is a punishment or a chastisement possibly or maybe a persecution. But in the end, God wants us to come forth as gold. In the end, God wants to purify us and he wants us to be better at the end of the trial, at the end of the tribulation than we were at the beginning. So there are cases where there's nothing going on. It's not persecution from the devil. It's not, it's not anything like that. God just wants you to lose sometimes. God just wants you to go through a hard time. I'm going to be looking at it here in just a minute. We're going to, we're going to get into some of the things you know, uh, of why this is uh, so and why God does this in the Bible. I want you to look at me at Judges chapter number 20. I want you to look at verse number 11. Notice what happens here in your Bible. Judges chapter number 20, verse number 11. The 
Bible says, so all the men of Israel were gathered against the city, knit together as one man. And the tribes of Israel sent men through all the tribe of Benjamin, saying, What wickedness is this that this is that is done among you? Now therefore deliver us the men, the children of Belial, which are in Gibeah, that we may put them to death and put away evil from Israel. But the children of Benjamin would not hearken to the voice of their brethren, the children of Israel. But the children of Benjamin gathered themselves together out of the cities unto Gibeah to go out to battle against the children of Israel. And the children of Benjamin were numbered at that time out of the cities twenty and six thousand men that drew sword, beside the inhabitants of, of Gibeah, which were numbered seven hundred chosen men. Among all this people there were seven hundred chosen men left-handed. Every one could sling stones in a handbreadth and not miss. And the men of Israel beside Benjamin were numbered four hundred thousand men that drew sword. All these were men of war. And the children of Israel rose and went up to the house of God and asked counsel of God and said, Which of us shall go up first to the battle against the children of Benjamin? And the Lord said, Judah shall go up first. And the children of Israel rose up in the morning and encamped against Gibeah. And the men of Israel went out to battle against Benjamin. And the men of Israel put themselves in array to fight against them at Gibeah. And the children of Benjamin came forth out of Gibeah and destroyed down to the ground of the Israelites that day twenty and two thousand men. And the people, the men of Israel, encouraged themselves and set their battle again in array in the place where they put themselves in array the first day. And the children of Israel went up and wept before the Lord until even and asked counsel of the Lord, saying, Shall I go up again to battle against the children of Benjamin, my brother? And the Lord said, Go up against them. I want you to notice that in this particular situation, of course, we read the whole context a moment ago. We went through the chapter that the children of Israel aren't doing anything wrong. They're not in a particular sin. There's no sin that's mentioned that's going on in the nation of Israel. There's no problems. There, 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 there's no iniquity that's hidden. Nothing ends up happening with that. What actually took place was, of course, the man that had the concubine. It's a very well-known story because it's a very gruesome and, and, and uh, uh, disgusting type of story out of all those in the Bible. There's a man who has a concubine, and uh, you know that's just, just a lower or lesser wife. And this, this woman runs away from him. He goes back to get her, and when he goes back to retrieve her, he gets her and he brings her back. She, of course, went back to her hometown, her father-in-law. He's bringing her back, and he stops in a particular land, the land there with the Benjamites and, and, the, the, and with Gibeah, and he lodges there. A very similar story happens like what happened with Sodom and Gomorrah. The Sodomites come, and they, they uh, try to come in, and they want the man, but they don't get the man, so they settle with the woman. And they end up taking the woman and, and abusing her and, and of course, uh, lying with her, and then they kill her. And they bring her back, and they just lay her dead body there and leave it for her husband to find. Well, of course, he's you know, heartbroken, and he's hurt, and he's angry, and he takes his wife, and he takes her back to his home, and what he does is he takes her body, and he cuts her body up into 12 pieces. Now, he did that so that he could send each of those pieces out to the tribes, all the tribes of Israel, so that he would get their attention. Obviously, if you receive a head in the mail, you're going to respond to it. If you receive an arm or a hand in the mail, you're going to respond to it. You're going to think, what in the world is going on? That's the reason why he did that. It's not meant to show that he's some sort of depraved person. He's desperate, and he wants to make sure that he gets everyone's attention. And he actually says, if you look at your Bible, I don't remember exactly how it's worded, uh, but uh, he says in, uh, in Judges chapter number 20, Right, yeah, verse number 6. And I took my concubine and cut her in pieces and sent her throughout all the country of the inheritance of Israel. For they, notice 4, because they have committed lewdness and folly in Israel. So why did he do it? They committed lewdness, something disgusting, and folly, that's foolishness, like a horrible sin in Israel. So he wanted to show these people how bad this was that happened. That was meant to represent what had happened unto him. So he wanted to make sure that he got their attention. Of course, that got their attention. They came and they're like, what is going on? He explained everything to them, and they, they knew, and they had a righteous heart and said, this is ungodly. This is wicked, and these people deserve the death penalty. They didn't go there trying to kill the Benjamites. They didn't go there trying to just wipe out the entire city. They went there with the right heart, and they went there and they said, hey, men of Benjamin, send out the men of Gibeon to us. Send them out to us. Send out the, the and they call them the men of Belial, of the devil, Right? 
And they say, send those men out to us that we may put them to death. They have the right heart and they want justice to be served in this type of situation. So what happens is they assemble all together and then they go and they pray first to God. They take counsel with God first. I want you to notice over and over again that they have the right heart. They're doing what is right. They're not in sin. They're not committing iniquity. They have the right heart. They go and they pray to God and they take counsel of God and they even ask God, what shall we do? Who shall go up first? Shall we go to battle against the men of Gibeah? And I want you to look at verse number 11. Look at verse number 11 once more with me. It says, So all the men of Israel were gathered against the city, knit together as one man. And the tribes of Israel sent men through all the tribes of Benjamin, saying, What wickedness is this that is done, done among you? Now therefore deliver us the men. So notice, the children of Belial. So they're just requesting the men of Belial. They just want justice to be served on the men that had done this wickedness. Then the men of Benjamin say no. The men of Benjamin come out and they're going to defend the men of the devil, these wicked men. Then verse number 18, and the children of Israel rose and went up to the house of God and asked counsel of God and said, which of us shall go up first to the battle against the children of Benjamin? And the Lord said, Judah shall go up first. Now, did God tell them to go forth to battle? Yes, he did. And he specifically said, even answer, who should go up first to battle? And who did he say? He said Judah. Now, of course, I believe in an all-knowing God. The Bible teaches an all-knowing God. And God told them, even in spite of them not doing any wrong, in spite of them not doing any wickedness, God said, Judah shall go forth to battle. And what ended up happening? Look there in verse number 19. And the children of Israel rose up in the morning and encamped against Gibeah. And the men of Israel went out to battle against Benjamin. And the men of Israel put themselves in array to fight against them at Gibeah. And the children of Benjamin came forth out of Gibeah and destroyed down to the ground of the Israelites that day, 20 and 2,000 men. I want you to notice this was a terrible loss. This was not a small defeat. If you read about battles and stuff, a lot of times it's a lot less than this. Notice it says 20 and 2,000 men. That is a lot of loss. That is a lot of, you know, a lot of fatalities in a battle. And who told them to go ahead and go forth the battle? God did. God said, they went and asked, and he said specifically, Judah. And he said, yes, you should go up, and Judah should go up first. You know what that tells me? God wanted them to lose. God is all-knowing. God knew what was going to happen. And he told them to go up anyways. And you know what happened? They lost. So you can see God's character. We're going to see this more in the Bible. There are times in our lives, there are times in the Israelites' history, there are times in Christians' lives where God wants you to lose. Now, this is the last thing that you're ever going to hear some sort of, you know, Joel Osteen type of preacher tell you, but these are things that we need to hear. You know, we're going to be going through the Book of Lamentations on Wednesday night. And the Book of Lamentations is avoided, it's ignored many times. You know why? Because it's negative. You know why these types of subjects are, are ignored and why Joel Osteen would never make a statement in his life that God wants you to lose? It's because it's negative. And he wants to just tell you the things that tickle your ears. He wants to tell you only positive things, things that you want to hear, things that are going to make you feel good so you're going to keep coming back to him. Obviously, he has you know, uh, uh, an agenda of wanting money from people, so he's just going to keep trying to get you to come back for that reason. But these prosperity preachers, they stand up and they, they would preach to you and teach to you that God always wants you to win. That God always wants everything good to happen in your life, and that is not true. There are times when God wants you to lose. And you may be at a state in your life, you may be at a, at later on, you may experience something many years later. You are going to be at times in your life, let me just say that, where God wants you to lose. Where God will want you to have a loss. God will want you to lose. God will, will, it will be God's will that some sort of problem, trial, tribulation arises in your life. And it's God's will that it's going to happen. I want you to go to John chapter number 11. John chapter number 11. Now, you know, of course, the, the Joel Osteen, they're just going to preach, you know, just the tickling ears messages. But that's not always what we need to hear because you know what ends up happening? The type of people that listen to a Joel Osteen, that listen to these prosperity preachers, that just tell them everything's going to be good in your life. Those types of people are the ones that completely fall away from God if they're saved or they just completely reject the, uh, you know, the God of the Bible and the Bible in general. When they ask 
actually start experiencing hardship and problems and trials because they've been fed this false narrative and this, you know, this, this, you know, uh, 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 unrealistic type of expectations for life and the Bible. The Bible is an extremely negative book. Because life is very, very negative. So you know what the Bible does? It braces you for life. And it guides us, and it makes sense of the problems in life, and the chaos, and the confusion, and all the different things that we go through in our life. And it helps us to make it through these types of things. That's why it's so, it's so disheartening when you have somebody like a prosperity preacher just standing up there, and it's like he's just reading off, you know, like uh, out of a fortune cookie, one after the next. You know, you will have... You know, you will make a connection tomorrow that will change your lives forever. You know, that kind of retarded stuff. Just repeatedly, over and over again. Today will be the best day of your life. These are, that sounds like a Joel Osteen sermon. But that's not life. So, there are times. There are times when God is going to want us to lose. There are times when God wants trials and tribulations to come in our life. Not because we're being persecuted. That's not the reason. Not because we've sinned. There are times where God just wants, for other reasons, God wants, and I'm gonna, that's what we're going to go over. What are the reasons why? I'm going to give you, I believe, three reasons, maybe four. I have to look at my notes here in a minute, but you'll find out. Uh, why God wants us to lose. I want you to look at John chapter number 11, verse number 1. The Bible says, Now a certain man was sick named Lazarus of Bethany, the town of Mary and her sister Martha. It was that Mary which anointed the Lord with ointment and wiped his feet with her hair, whose brother Lazarus was sick. Therefore his sister sent unto him, saying, Lord, behold, he whom thou lovest is sick. Now Lazarus, when you read on about this and you look at Lazarus and Jesus' relationship, Lazarus was very close to Jesus. Lazarus was not just a common man that followed Jesus. Lazarus was not just an acquaintance of Jesus. They were very close, and Jesus loved Lazarus deeply. They had a very close relationship. That's why she makes the statement there, he whom thou lovest is sick. Look at verse 4. When Jesus heard that, he said, this sickness is not unto death, but for the glory of God, that the Son of God might be glorified thereby. thereby. So right there, of course, we can see the general answer, one of the general answers of why uh, you know, uh, uh, problems may arise in our life, why we may lose, why God may want us to lose. It's the, the purpose of all things is so that God can receive glory. I'm going to get a little bit more specific here in a moment, but the overall reason, of course, is so that God can receive glory. God ultimately, through different avenues, through different ways, you know, by you losing, can receive glory. Now, I want you to notice that, that he said, hey, this sickness is not unto death. Now, this was obviously a, a, a serious sickness. Of course, Lazarus is dying of it. So it was a serious sickness, and that's why Martha comes to him and tells him, hey, you know, he who thou lovest is sick. Why? Because she knows this is serious. My brother is possibly going to be dying. My brother is on his deathbed right now. And, and Jesus responding, talking about someone on their deathbed, you know, he responds. Talking about Lazarus losing, he says, hey, it's okay. Because out of this is going to be glory brought to God. I want you to look at verse number 5. Keep reading verse number 5. Now Jesus loved Martha and her sister and Lazarus. When he had heard, therefore, that he was sick, he abode two days still in the same place where he was. Then after that, saith he to his disciples, Let us go into Judea again. His disciples say unto him, Master, the Jews of late sought to stone thee, and goest thou thither again? Jesus answered, Are not twelve hours in the day? If any man walk in the day, he stumbleth not because he seeth the light of this world. But if a man walk in the night, he stumbleth, because there is no light in him. These things said he, and after that he saith unto them, Our friend Lazarus sleepeth, but I go that I may awake him out of sleep. Then said his disciples, Lord, if he sleep, he shall do well. Now watch this. How be it, Jesus spake of his death, but they thought that he had spoken of taking of rest in sleep. Now, if you pay close attention to the story here, there was only one messenger that came to Jesus. And, of course, was Martha. And what was the, the message that Martha brought to Jesus? Lazarus is sick. Now, was there any message at that time that Lazarus had died? No. Never brought any message specifically that Lazarus had died. That's why Jesus' disciples were clueless. But, of course, Jesus being God, knowing people's thoughts, knowing, you know, all things... 
You know what Jesus knew about this sickness? That Lazarus was about to die. He already knew from the very beginning that out of this sickness, what was going to happen? God was going to receive glory. From the very beginning, God was going to receive glory. Now, if you pay close attention also, you would have noticed that when this news was brought to Jesus, Jesus didn't leave right away. Jesus didn't go there right away. Did you notice that? It says that he waited two days. He waited two days before he went to Lazarus. But then after that, it's revealed that all along, Jesus knew what? That Lazarus was going to die. Because he tells his disciples he sleepeth. And they, they thought that he, taught him, they, that he uh, spoke of you know, taking a nap, like sleeping in that sense. But he was saying, and he spoke plainly, you know, Lazarus is dead. Lazarus died. So Jesus knew all along, didn't he? But he didn't go right away, did he? Now, could Jesus have prevented Lazarus from dying? While he was still alive and he was just sick, he raised many people on their death. But he brought people back from the dead. And of course, we're going to see he brought Lazarus back from the dead. Could he have arrived before Lazarus died and prevented him from dying? But you know what that tells you? That he wanted Lazarus to die. That's pretty serious. He stepped back and he waited two days until Lazarus died. And then he said, now let's go to Jerusalem. You know what he wanted? He wanted Lazarus to lose. That's pretty serious, losing your own life. I mean, what more can you lose than your life? What are you giving? What, what, what do you have? Everything is wrapped up and summed up in your life. Everything is. You can't lose any more than that. Do you know what God wanted? God wanted him to lose. He wanted him to lose his life. Now, I want you to see why. Keep reading there. We read down to verse number, where did we stop? Verse 14. Verse 15, he says, and I am glad, watch this, for your sakes that I was not there, to the intent ye may believe. Nevertheless, let us go unto him. I want you to notice what he said right there. He said, I am glad for your sakes. I am glad for your sakes. What? That Lazarus had died. Notice that other people are benefiting out of Lazarus losing. Lazarus lost. And God, Jesus, that is, wanted Lazarus to lose. Why? So that other people could benefit. He said, I am glad for your sakes. That I was not there to the intent ye may believe. And then he says, nevertheless, let us go unto him. So even still... Let us go on to him. I want you to look now. Let's uh, look at verse 17. Then when Jesus came, he found that he had lain in the grave for four days already. Now Bethany was nigh unto Jerusalem, about 15 furlongs off. And many of the Jews came to Martha and Mary to comfort them concerning their brother. Then Martha, as soon as she had heard that Jesus was coming, went and met him. But Mary sat still in the house. Then said Martha unto Jesus, Lord, if thou hast been here... My brother had not died. I want you to notice what she said. She knew. He knew. But he waited anyways. Thou hast been here. My brother had not died. Verse 22. But I know that even now, whatsoever thou wilt ask of God, God will give it thee. Jesus saith unto her, Thy brother shall rise again. Martha saith unto him, I know that he shall rise again in the resurrection of the last day. Jesus said unto her, I am the resurrection and the life. He that believeth in me, though he were dead, yet shall he live. And whosoever liveth and believeth in me shall never die. Believest thou this? She saith unto him, Yea, Lord, I believe that thou art the Christ, the Son of God, which should come into the world. I want you to look down at verse number 33 now. When Jesus therefore saw her weeping, and the Jews also weeping which came with her, he groaned in the spirit. And was troubled. You see Jesus' humanity very much We're in this passage right here. Not many times you, know, you, can, you can see this. Verse number 34, it said, where, where have you laid him? They said unto him, Lord, come and see. And the shortest verse in the whole Bible, chapter 11, verse 35. Jesus wept. Then said the Jews, behold how he loved him. So you can see that he cared much for Lazarus. He's weeping, he's crying. They're looking at him saying, behold how he loved him. Look at how much Jesus loved him. 
And some of them said, Could not this man which opened the eyes of the blind have caused that even this man should not die? Jesus, therefore, again groaning in himself, cometh to the grave. It was a cave, and a stone lay upon it. Jesus said, Take ye away the stone. Martha, the sister of him that was dead, saith unto him, Lord, by this time he stinketh. For he hath been dead four days. Jesus saith unto her, Said I not unto thee, that if thou wouldest believe, thou shouldest see the glory of God? Then they took away the stone from the place where the dead was laid. And Jesus lifted up his eyes and said, Father, I thank thee that thou hast heard me. And I knew that thou hearest me always. But because of the people which stand by, I said it, that they may believe that thou hast sent me. And when he thus had spoken, he cried with a loud voice, Lazarus, come forth. And he that was dead came forth, bound hand and foot with grave clothes, and his face was bound about with a napkin. Jesus saith unto them, Loose him, and let him go. Now watch this, verse number 45. Then many of the Jews which came to Mary, and had seen the things which Jesus did, believed on him. Now, I want you to notice that Jesus very well knew that Lazarus was going to die. Jesus specifically and purposely waited the exact amount of time that it would take for him to get there after Lazarus would already be dead. No one came and told Jack Lazarus that he was going to die, but he knew. And you know what he did? He waited anyways. And then he revealed this truth to his disciples and explained to them, Lazarus is dead. And you know, once Lazarus has died, you know then what he said? All right, let's go to Jerusalem. Isn't that interesting? Or Bethany, I'm sorry. It's right there near Jerusalem. They're, you know, it gives you the, the, the time. I can't remember exactly what it is. A certain amount of furlough. But they're very close to one another. So then he heads to Bethany once he knows that Lazarus has all, had already died. And he made a specific statement to his disciples. I'll read it to you one more time. And then I'll give you the second point of what we learned. It says, and I am glad for your sakes that I was not there. To the intent ye may believe. So I want you to notice, as I said earlier, that he was glad that Lazarus had died for their sakes. He was glad that Lazarus had lost so that they could gain something. He said, for your sakes, and he said, that ye may believe. Then, when Jesus shows up and he raises Lazarus from the dead, and he walks over, he says, Lazarus. Come forth. The result of that was in verse 45, it says this, 1145. Then many of the Jews which came to Mary and had seen the things which Jesus did believed on him. The very first point and observation that I want to make to you tonight about why God will want you to sometimes lose is this. You may lose in life. God may want you to lose in life so that other people can win. You may go through a problem, you may go through a trial or a tribulation or whatever it may be in your personal life so that other people can ultimately win. You may have some sort of major problem, major trial. You may go through something small, you may go through something big, but the purpose of that in God's will and in his plan for your life is that other people would end up being victorious out of that. Just like how Lazarus had to lose his life. I mean, that's pretty extreme. God, Jesus, allowed Lazarus to die so that other people could win. So that other people could benefit from Lazarus' loss. Lazarus, think about this. Lazarus had to die for other people to be born again. If Lazarus would not have died, those people would not have gotten saved. Lazarus' death prepared the perfect Situation for people to put their faith in the Lord Jesus Christ and be saved. Sometimes you have to lose so that other people can win. Sometimes you have to lose so that other people can be born again. Now, there's a really interesting story about this and a testimony that I have. You know, everything that... So, I, I, let me begin with this. I'll begin with the introduction with this, of the story, quickly. Um, Jessica's... Uh, uh, my mother-in-law, Jessica's mother, was very hard into the gospel. For, for a long period of time, you know, from, from 21, let's say, I was 21 years old until I was about 24, uh, roughly, 
uh, almost 25 before we moved to Arizona. Jessica in, in, had tried to give her the gospel multiple times while we were living in northern Kentucky, greater Cincinnati, before we had relocated to Arizona. Numerous times. Do you even know how many times? Multiple times. To the point where she just wouldn't talk to her about it. Just completely had shut her out, would not speak to her at all. We moved to Arizona, and you know, sometimes she was able to talk to her over the phone about it a little bit, but still not very much. Hardly at all. Then, of course, as everyone knows, everything happened in Arizona. And we unexpectedly had to move back to northern Kentucky. And we did not plan on that. That was not in my cards. I didn't think I was ever going to live in northern Kentucky again. And we moved back to northern Kentucky. And during that period of time, Jessica built a relationship again with her mother a little bit. Where they were closer, they were talking more. And then, one time on a trip when they went to some sort of, uh, uh, what was it? The Willy Worm Festival. I'm sure everybody's like, wow, that sounds cool. Right. The Willy Worm Festival. I don't even know what that is. They went to the Willy Worm Festival. And while they were on their way or coming back, one of the two, the Willy Worm Festival, Jessica had the opportunity again to preach the gospel to her mother, my mother-in-law. Do you know what happened? She believed it, and she got saved. Yeah. Now, if you look at, the, at the, the, the way that everything unraveled in our lives, and you look at how you know, th we were you know, moving more and more away from her, and you could see that Jessica's relationship with her mother was, was you know, that's what happens. You know, what concord hath Christ with Belial? The more you draw closer to Christ, it's sad that those that are not saved, even if they're family members, you'll move further away from them. And they'll become a larger and larger wedge in between the two. And... You know, you look at what took place in Arizona, which, you know, there was a lot of bad that happened in that situation, but there was a lot of good things that came out of that. There was, a, there was many good things. And if the only good thing, I can name many other good things, but if the only good thing that came out of that was Jessica's mother getting saved, that's good enough. You may think, well, man, that's pretty, you know, that's pretty extreme that you'd let all that happen just so, yeah, one person could not spend eternity in hell. Yeah. That's good enough. Amen. Lazarus lost his life and died so that multiple people could be saved. So that multiple people, he you know, died. He lost his life so that people could be born again. You know, there's multiple things. I grew closer relationships with many different people over that period of time. I got to meet many different people. I can't tell you how many people told me, like, I, you know, it's terrible what happened, but I'm glad that this took place. The, the, you know, uh, we love the Faulkners to death. The Faulkners uh, made a statement one time that, hey, we're really sad about what happened in Arizona. But I don't want this to sound selfish, but we're happy we got to know you guys, you know, so well. And we got you guys, you know, uh, moved back up here. We got to spend so much time with you. Obviously, they were a blessing to us just as, what, as much as we were to them. You know, I'm happy about that. So you know what ended up happening? We lost, but you know what? A lot of other people gained. We had major bad things happen. You know, we had good things happen to us also as a result of that as well. But a lot of good ended up coming out of that for other people also. Just like Lazarus lost, and Lazarus had to lose, and something very bad had to happen to Lazarus. Like I said, that's the most extreme example as you could possibly get. Losing your life is all you have. And what happened to other people? Other people were able to be saved. Other people were able to be born again. Because why? Because Lazarus lost. So notice that point number one is you may lose so that other people may gain. You may lose so that other people may gain. I want you to go to John chapter number nine and give you another example of this. And give you two other points back to back. John chapter number nine. <clears throat> John chapter number nine, verse number one. And as Jesus passed by, he saw a man which was blind from his birth. And his disciples asked him, saying, Master, who did sin, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? Sound like Job's friends, right? Or, you know, Joel Osteen, just like we were talking about a minute ago. Verse 3, Jesus answered, Neither hath this man sinned nor his parents. Now watch this. But that the works of God should be made manifest in him. I must work the works of him that sent me while it is day. The night cometh when no man can work. We just sang the song that comes from that verse, by the way. That's where that song comes from, if you know that. But... Now, I want you to notice what he said. He tells you, he says, they asked, the disciples asked, who did sin that this man was born blind? Was it his, was it his sin or his parents? Which is a, an odd question because it's like, you know, 
Did, did God foresee his sin? Are they getting into Calvinism here? Did God foresee his sin, some horrible sin that he would do, and then God cursed him to be blind for the rest of his life? Right? But because uh, he said born blind, that he was born blind. So they're, they're trying to, they're, they're having this attitude that basically is, is webbed into this series of why is this happening to me? That, that would have been a good title if I would have forethought that a little bit better. You know, uh, why is this happening to me? And all the different reasons why you can have these problems, devils, you know, persecuting you, the world persecuting you, all these different things, right? And they're, they're assuming the, the, the one option that so many people do. It's his sin. And Jesus is like, no, it has nothing to do with that. He didn't do anything wrong. Nobody did anything wrong. That's not the problem here. That's, it's not anything like that. It's not persecution. It's not the devil. It's nothing like that. You know the only reason? That God will be glorified. So that the works will be done. And he says this, neither has this man sinned nor his parents, but that the works of God should be made manifest in him. Point number two is you may lose just that somebody else might be edified. You may lose so that somebody else may be edified. Now, if you look at all the different situations when, when Jesus is going around healing people, there's multiple different people with multiple different disabilities, with different dis disadvantages, all these different problems that they have in their life, all different types of issues. And Jesus goes and he'll heal these people. And you know what that ends up being? It ends up being a blessing to everybody else. It ends up, maybe people that are already saved, maybe people that were backslidden and having problems in their own Christian life, it ended up edifying them and getting their life right with God. But you know, that person had to live with a loss their whole life up to that point. This man had to live his life all the way into his adulthood blind where he could not see a thing. That's a major curse. That's a major problem in trial. And you know the only reason? So that Jesus could heal him and bless other people by seeing it. Amen. I want you to think about that. I mean, that's pretty serious. The only, Jesus answers the question. It's not for sin. It's not for his sin. It's not for his parents' sin. This only happened so that I can heal him and bless other people. Amen. And that other people would believe on it. And that this would edify other people. Sometimes you're going to have losses. You're going to have disadvantages. You're going to have problems in your own life so that other people can be blessed by your testimony. So that other people maybe can see the works of God in your life, and then you can edify or bless those people. Not only that, but point number three, your testimony in general with your specific trial or tribulation can help others. Turn to James chapter number five. We're very close to being done. James chapter number five. You, God may allow you to go through a trial. God may allow you to go through a problem or a tribulation, a very specific issue. And I know that this has happened to me in my life. So that you can bump into someone, or you can maybe become friends with someone, or, or grow a relationship with someone, and then find out that they had the exact same thing happen to them. Or they went through the exact same problem, and you know what you can be? You can be an example of that person. That could be the reason why God allowed bad things to happen to you. That could be the reason why God wants you to lose. You know, it's a pretty powerful thought thinking God wants you to lose. To the extent of being blind your whole life. To the extent of losing your life... But you know what? You have to lose so that other people can gain. Look at James chapter number 5. This is, of course, whoops, I went too far. James chapter number 5 is about Job is what we're going to read. James 5 verse 10 is about Job. Now, what happened to Job outside of losing your life doesn't get any worse. Some people would probably argue that it would probably be better to lose your life. He lost his children. All of his children died. You know, his wife left him. He lost all of his wealth. He was literally the richest man, basically, in, you know, in the world, if you just want to say that, the East. He was a righteous man. I mean, everything. I mean, he was an extremely wealthy man, lost everything. It couldn't have been any worse. A lot of people, as I said, would probably say, I'd rather die than have all that happen. He's cursed from, like the he from his head to his feet, just the crown of his head to the soles of his feet. I mean, it doesn't get any worse than what happened to Job. He's, you know... Using pot shards, just broken shards. That's shards and shards are basically the same word. Shards of glass or ceramic, whatever they made it out of, clay. And he's like having to scrape all of the different things off of him. He's scraping, what's going on? He's scraping the blisters and the boils off of him. So he had, it was, it was horrible, obviously. He went through just terrible persecution and hardship. It was absolutely horrible. But do you know why that, was, that, why that happened? Let me ask you this. Was it because he was living such a 
godly life and he was receiving persecution just randomly? No. That's not the reason why. Ultimately, when you read the story, God offers Job to the devil. God's the one that brings Job up. God actually says it to Job. I'm sorry. God says it to the devil. I'm sorry. God actually says Job to the devil. The devil explains to him, hey, you know, the, the, uh, God asks him, like, from whence comest thou? And he's like, from going to and fro in the earth and from walking up and down in it. That's the statement that comes from the book of 1 Peter where it tells you that the devil, you know, that your adversary, the devil, go, you know, walketh about as a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. So God understood what that meant. I'm looking for somebody to destroy. And you know what God says? Hast thou considered my servant Job? The devil didn't even think about it. The devil didn't even bring him up. So do you know what that means? God wanted those things to happen to Job. I don't care if that if atheists try to get a hold of that. I don't care. This is how God operates sometimes. This is if people will try to will even try to look at that. Well, God, yeah, you're right. God wanted Job to lose. Sometimes God wants people to lose. Do you know why God wanted Job to, to, to lose? Do you know how many millions of people, billions of people, have been going through hard times and afflictions and Christians that have sat down and just read the book of Job because of the problems they're going through? God wanted that to happen to Job only for Job. This is the reason. It's like, did his parents sin or did he? Was it his kids sin or what was it? There's one reason. Because God wanted Job to be an example to every Christian that sat down and read the Bible from then going forward. None of those. It's so that he could be an example to all other Christians. That's the reason why. Look at James chapter number 5. I want you to look at verse number 10. James chapter 5 verse number 10. Take my brethren the prophets who have spoken in the name of the Lord for an example of suffering, affliction, and of patience. Behold, we count them happy which endure. You have heard of the patience of Job, and have seen the end of the Lord, that the Lord is very pitiful and of tender mercy. I want you to notice, what did he tell you right there? He, he wants the, the Holy Spirit writing. He tells you why Job is in the Bible. He's talking about enduring and needing patience and afflict, going through affliction. You know what he says? You know what would help you? Read the book of Job. That's what he's saying. Do you know what will help you get through these problems? Read about Job. Do you know why all of that happened? Hast thou considered my servant Job? God wanted Job to lose. God wanted bad things to happen to Job. Just like Jesus wanted Lazarus to die. He wanted to wait until Lazarus died. Just like God wanted the children of Israel when they went forth to battle against the Benjamites to lose. He said, go forth. And he said, Judah shall go first. And you know what happened? They lost. And thousands of people died. Sometimes God wants you to lose. Why? Sometimes you have to lose so that you can help other people. Sometimes you have to lose so that other people can be born again, so other people can get saved. Sometimes you need to lose in your life so that you can edify other people, and other people can maybe get back into serving the, the, the God, get back, into, get back into serving God, and get back into the Christian life and fighting the Christian life. Sometimes you need to lose in your life so that when you learn how to get through it, you can be an example and you can have a testimony to help other people that go through the exact same thing. Just like Job was, God said, hast thou considered my servant Job? And then he said many, many years later, he said, uh, uh, take the prophets for an example, like Job. What's the reason why he allowed it to happen to Job? To be an example. Go back to Judges. Judges chapter number 20. Judges chapter number 20. Joshua Judges. Judges chapter number 20. Look at... What do we leave off? Verse number... We left off in verse number 23. We'll read 23 more time. The children of Israel went up and wept before the Lord until even and asked counsel of the Lord, saying, Shall I go up again to battle against the children of Benjamin, my brother? And the Lord said, Go up against him. And the children of Israel came near against the children of Benjamin the second day. Won't you notice the second day? 
And Benjamin went forth against them out of, out of Gibeah the second day and destroyed down to the ground of the children of Israel again. 18,000 men. All these drew the sword. What did God tell them, them to do? They said, shall I go up to battle? And he said, go up to battle. This is the second time, the second day. There's no doubting, there's no misunderstanding that God wants them to lose. God wanted them to lose, not only once, but twice. But keep looking. Look at what it says now. <clears throat> Verse number um, 26. Where did we leave off there again? I've lost my place. Yeah, 26. Then all the children of Israel and all the people went up and came into the house of God and wept and sat there before the Lord and fasted that day until even and offered burnt offerings and peace offerings before the Lord. And the children of Israel inquired of the Lord for the ark of the covenant of God was there in those days. Don't you notice in verse number 26, so all the other things were so that other people would benefit, right? It was so that other people could get saved. It was so that other people could be edified. It was so that other people could learn from your example and learn from your testimony. And you could help them. If you learn how to get through this problem, you could teach them and guide them through it. But not only that, sometimes God wants you to lose so that you can come forth as, as gold, like Job said. So that you can grow closer to God and you can grow closer to God in the hard times. You know, the Bible talks about repeatedly, David talks about, and it's almost verbatim quoted like five times, where it says, seek the Lord in, the in a time of trouble or in the time of trouble. It comes up over and over and over again. Because oftentimes, you know what you need to happen to bring you closer back to God? Something hard in life. Something that you now realize, I can't do this by myself. This is not a battle that I'm going to be able to win on my own. This is not something that I am going to be able to, to do all by myself. You know what I need? I have to have God in this situation. So sometimes God wants you to lose to show you that the only way that you can win is with him. Now remember I said that in general, all of it is meant to do what? To bring God glory. Now, other people benefited from Lazarus' death in John chapter 11, but what was the reason why Jesus said that he allowed Lazarus to die? When he answered the question directly in John chapter number 11 and verse number 4, he said, it is for the glory of God. He said, this sickness is for the glory of God. When he's praying out there, he even says when he's praying to God, it's that the Son of God might be glorified through this. So sometimes, yes, it's for other people, point one, point two, point three. We need to think about others first. But sometimes it's also for yourself so that when you lose, you can now understand and know, hey, I can't do this by myself. And it causes you to depend upon the Lord more. It causes you to seek God's face and to grow closer to God. And you know what you end up doing? You end up realizing, I can't do this without God. You know what you do? You end up growing so close to God in a relationship that you can keep throughout your life. You grow closer to God than you had ever been before. Yeah. You come through as, as gold. Like Job said, he understood the situation, and Job even said, he said, and, you know, after these problems and these trials and these tribulations, what's going to end up ha happening is I'm going to come out like gold. I'm going to be a better person than I was before. I'm going to be a better Christian. I'm going to know God. I'm going to love God. I'm going to trust God more than I did before. What you need to do is you need to be in situations sometimes that humble you and help you to realize, like, I can't do this. I can't do life without God. I can't make it through anything without God. And do you know what happened here in verse number 26? The, the, the men of Israel cried to God like they had never cried to God before. They wept before God like they had ne never wept before God before. They prayed to God and they trusted God and beseeched God like they had never done it before. Do you know why? Because they had lost. Do you know the reason why? They had to lose first. Verse 26. Then all the children of Israel and all the people went up and came unto the house of God and wept and sat there before the Lord and fasted that day until even. Notice the fasting, the praying, the seeking the face of God like they had never sought the face of God. And you know what it took to do that, to bring them that close to the Lord? God wanted them to lose because he wanted to have a closer relationship with them. Because he loved them and he wanted to know them more. 
He wanted to have a better relationship. He wanted to know them more, and he wanted them to know him more. That's why God wanted them to lose. Look at verse number 27. And the children of Israel inquired of the Lord, for the ark of the covenant of God was there in those days. And Phinehas, the son of Eleazar, the son of Aaron, stood before it in those days, saying, Shall I yet go again out to battle against the children of Benjamin, my brother, or shall I cease? And the Lord said, Go up, for tomorrow I will deliver them into thine hand. And Israel set liars in wait round about Gibeah. Now notice this time when he told them to go up, he made this statement. He said, Go up, for tomorrow I will deliver them into my hand. Do you know what they knew when they won this battle? God did it. So you know who ended up receiving the glory? God did That's the only difference. When you read the statements, do you know what he says there, oh, the first two times? You can go back and read it later. When he tells them to go, they say, shall we go up? Do you know what he says every other time? Go up. He says, go up. Judas shall go up first. And they ask, shall we go up again? After they've lost? You know what he says? Go up. You know what he says this time? Go up, for I will deliver them into thy hand. Do you know what he wanted them to do? He wanted them to trust him more. When you lose, it makes you understand that you must depend upon the Lord. When you go through these problems and you're not able to do it on your own, now the next time you're like, obviously, I already know I can't do it. So the only way that it's going to happen is if God does it for me. If God is the reason why I'm victorious. And you know, that, you know what ends up happening? It pleases the Lord because that's what he wants and that's what he desires is so that he can receive glory. And then it goes on. The children of Israel went up against the children of Benjamin on the third day. Don't you notice that these happened in, in days? First day, second day, third day. Back to back to back. That's important because I want to give you a, 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 some typology in just a moment. A picture. And the children of Israel went up against the children of Benjamin on the third day and put themselves in array against Gibeah as at other times. And the children of Benjamin went out against the people and were drawn away from the city. And they began to smite of the people and kill as at other times. And the highways of which one goeth up to the house of God and the other to Gibeah in the field and about 30 men of Israel. And the children of Benjamin said, they are smitten down before us as at the first. But the children of Israel said, let us flee and draw them. From the city under the highways. And all the men of Israel rose up out of their place and put themselves in array at Del Tamar. And the liars in weight of Israel came forth out of their places, even out of the meadows of Gibeah. And there came against Gibeah ten thousand chosen men out of all Israel. And the battle was sore, but they knew not that evil was near them. And the Lord smote Benjamin before Israel. And the children of Israel destroyed of the Benjamites that day twenty and five thousand and an hundred men. All these drew the sword. So the children of Benjamin saw that they were smitten, for the men of Israel gave place to the Benjamites, because they trusted under the liars in wait, which they had set beside Gibeah. And the liars in wait hasted and rushed upon Gibeah, and the liars in wait drew themselves along and smote all the city with the edge of the sword. Now there was an appointed sign between the men of Israel and the liars in wait, that they should make a great flame with smoke rise up out of the city. And when the men of Israel retired in the battle, Benjamin began to smite and kill the men of Israel, about 30 persons. Only 30 people this time died. For they said, surely they are smitten down before us as in the first battle. But when the flame began to arise up out of the city with a pillar of smoke, the Benjamites looked behind them, and behold, the flame of the city ascended up to heaven. And when the men of Israel turned again, the men of Benjamin were amazed, for they saw that evil was come upon them. Therefore they turned their backs before the men of Israel unto the way of the wilderness, but the battle overtook them. And them which came out of the cities they destroyed in the midst of them. Thus they enclosed the Benjamites round about and chased them and trod them down with ease over against Gibeah toward the sun rising. And there fell of Benjamin 18,000 men. All these were men of valor. And they turned and fled toward the wilderness under the rock Reman. And they gleaned of them in the highways, 5,000 men, and pursued hard after them unto Gidim, Gidim, and slew 2,000 men of them, so that all which fell that day of Benjamin were 20 and 5,000 men that drew the sword. All these were men of valor. But 600 men turned and fled to the wilderness under the rock ring, and abode in the rock ring in four months. And the men of Israel turned again unto the children of Benjamin and smote them with the edge of the sword, as well the men of every city as the beast. And all that came to hand, also they set on fire all the cities that came to. I want you to notice now, the third time they go up, what took place? 
They were victorious, and they won. But the very first two times, just like, just like the third time, God told them to go up. You know what that tells you? God wanted them to lose. Now, did he want them to lose in the end? Of course not. He did not. Of course not. But the Bible tells us all things work together for good. To them that love God, to them who are called according to his purpose. Now, is that true in this situation with the Israelites? It is, isn't it? All things work together for good, right? Just like Joseph with the famous, extremely famous statement that he makes when he faces his brethren in the end, in Genesis 50, he tells them, you meant this for evil, but God meant it for good. You know, in that case, it was people trying to do something bad to him. In this case, God wanted them to lose. God may want you to lose sometimes in your life. God may want bad things to happen to you. God may want them to happen so that other people are benefit from it. So that other people can be saved. I mean, what is worth the soul of someone, of another person? You know? Uh, there's, 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 there's nothing that can value unto a person's soul. What can a man give in exchange for his soul? Say nothing. There's nothing. There's nothing that you can exchange for it because there's nothing that's equal in value to it. God may want you to lose so that other people can gain. So that other people may, may so that they can get saved. Maybe just so that another person can be edified. Even maybe an already saved person by your, uh, 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 by the works in your life and the disadvantage that you have. Like the blind man, God may see the works that are done in your life. Or maybe the works that you're able to do through God, even in spite of this disadvantage, and that may compel other people to get back into the fight. That may be a blessing to other people and edify other people to continue in their Christian life when they may have just ruined their Christian life and destroyed their Christian life. Not only that, thirdly, I just went blank, but I know I had another reason. Here it is. You may go through a specific trial or tribulation in your life, very specific, so that you can have that testimony. And there may be a person in your life that you may meet later on, that you can be an encouragement to, that you can teach and explain. You know, the, and I've done this multiple times in my life, things that I've went through and, and had to and help people and said, I've been through the exact same thing, and this is exactly what happened, and this is what I would have done differently, and this is what I wish I would have you know, done, and this is what I did that was right, that I would do again. So God may be... Allowing you to lose so that you can make sure that other people win. And other people don't have to lose. God may be allowing you to lose so that you can be an example to a hundred people. And stop a hundred other people from losing. But so that they can win. So that you can teach them and help them to get through this. So that one loss equals a hundred wins for other people. Of course this takes a selfless attitude... And it can be sometimes difficult to accept. But you have to, you know, you have to step back sometimes. You have to put other people above yourself. And that's, you know, it's, it's hard to do. I understand that. But if, if everyone's, everyone's life is, is, is you know, equal to one another. There's no person that's greater than another. If one person could lose so that 100 people could win, of course, then that would be the best decision. That would be the best thing that could happen. But not only that, fourthly, it's for yourself. It is for you as well, so that you can come forth as gold. So that you, without this trial, without this tribulation, you wouldn't have been as good of a person, as good of a Christian, had certain virtues and trials and, or uh, uh, patience that you've learned through tribulation. It makes you a better person. It's for you as well. I want to end with a, a really interesting typology real quick, and we are finished this evening. Notice there... That those things happen back to back to back. It says the second day. And then it says, and the third day. Now, there's a significance of three days all throughout the Bible. And every time, how many, how many days was Jonah in the belly of the whale? Three. Over and over and over again. I mean, you can point this out multiple times. Multiple times. There's a significance. Those first two days were loss. There was, there was hopelessness. There was death. Like what? Like when Jesus was in the tomb. You see the, uh, uh, the, the two men on the road to Emmaus. Jesus is resurrected, but they're not aware of that. And he hides himself and he comes to speak with them. And he asks them, you know, what manner of communication is this that you have among one another? And they start to talk, and, and, what, and what type of attitude do they have? 
an attitude of loss, an attitude of hopelessness, an attitude of, of just sadness. We've lost. It's over. Right? Because that was what was going on during those two days. They thought that there was defeat. You know, those two days represent the time where Jesus Christ was dead. Those two days represent the time of loss, the time of hopelessness, the time of sadness. But then you know what? The third day, you know what happened? He resurrected. He swallowed up death and victory. And this is also a picture of the Christian life because our life is, is our life is gone. It's, it's, it's dead and we are hid in Christ. We may go through problems and trials and tribulations and there's good that's going to come out of it and we can just focus on the, 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 the different points like I had just went through. But if we just look at the big picture, yes, there's going to be massive problems and trials and tribulations and they're not going to end here. But do you know what ultimately is going to happen? There's going to be, there's going to be life at the end of the tunnel. There's going to be you know, hope at the end of the tunnel. Just like with the Israelites in the very third battle, what took place? Victory. Just like on the third day, what took place? Victory. And that's what those three battles, I believe, that was meant to also be a typology for the time when the Lord Jesus Christ was dead and then he rose again. There was life. There was, of course, a blessing after that. And uh, there's so many different types in the Bible. So we can learn so much from this. But sometimes, this is what you need to walk away with in your life. There's different there's different reasons why bad things happen to you. And sometimes God just may want you to lose so that other people can gain. Sometimes he may want you to lose so that you can gain in the long end, in the long run. Let's bow our heads and have a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, God, we thank you, dear Lord, for your word. We thank you so much for uh, your wisdom uh, that, is, that is beyond our mind and, and our comprehension. We love you. We, we thank you for this church. We thank you for uh, um, um, all the children and, and uh, the services today. We ask you to be with us and bless us, dear God, and uh, be with the rest of the night. And uh, bless AJ on his birthday. We love you. In Jesus Christ's name, amen.